Hey, everybody, go to aromaretail.com. This website has tools for helping you select the best scent, and they're always happy to hear from their customers. You can also send them your business website address, and they'll take a look and come up with suggestions for you. Also on their website, click on the fragrance test in the header and answer just five simple questions to get instant recommendations on scents based on your preferences. On their website also is their complete list of world-class resorts fragrances, and you can make selections based on how well that brand or theme matches your home or business. If you're looking to create a specific mood, well, they also have the mood collection. Fragrance goes where the air goes. I got to tell you, my home has never smelled better since I've been working with aromaretail.com. You can go to the show notes and click on the link, use that special link, and then use code LIGHTS10. That's LIGHTS10 to get 10% off your offer. Or you can go to the website, beforethelightspod.com slash sponsors. Click on the Aroma Retail logo. That'll also take you to the special link and use the code LIGHTS10 there to get 10% off your entire order. Hey, everybody, it's Tommy Canelli, and welcome to Before the Lights Podcast, the show to find out how those in sports, music, and entertainment made their mark. Joining us today is the president of Tin Drum Music. He's a drummer, songwriter, singer, percussionist, producer, a founding member, and the only drummer percussionist for the five-time Grammy Award-nominated band, Ambrosia. Current members include Kip Lennon, Joe Porta, Mary Harris, Chris North, and Doug Jackson. Most of the original band members have been with the group for over 30 years. He has his own band called Tin Drum with wife and fellow Ambrosia member, Mary Harris. Please welcome to the show, Burley, the Magnificent Drummond. Burley, how are you? <laughs> Thank you for uh, thank you for addressing me properly with the uh, no I'm, I'm wonderful. Thank you for having me, Tommy. This is an honor to be here. Thank you, and I'm honored to have you on the show. You were born in Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, the only child and also an army brat. Your father was a colonel, mother was a nurse. How many times did you move as a child? Oh, every two years. Every two years. Uh, you know, I think I I grew up on every military base on the East Coast. And then we finally moved to Turkey, which we, that was the longest stay, Ankara, Turkey. I think we were there three and a half, four years, and then came back in to the West Coast, and I started, uh, you know, my West Coast uh, domination. <laughs> At age seven in Turkey, you watched and heard some artisans hammering on copper plates, which led to you wanting to be a drummer. Uh, explain this to my listeners. Well, okay, so... Um, you know, we were, I was at a bazaar with my mom uh, and I got separated from her and I just kind of wandered around some tents and I kind of went into the, I heard this cacophony happened and I went in and there was this, you know, those large copper plates uh, and there was a, you know, five, four or five guys sitting in a circle, spinning the plate and hammering. And uh, I don't know, something just overcame me and I just was uh, in a daze or in a, some kind of, you know, uh, you know, I just got caught up in it and just stood there. Uh, and my, my mom said, you know, she was, she was frantic, of course, because she mm -hmm. said I'd been gone about an hour. But, you know, I was just like amazed and caught up in the synchronicity. And, the, and they were all smiling and laughing and spinning this thing and hammering. And the, the, you know, the rhythm that they were making just was like captivating to me. So I think that's where it all started. I think uh, I've been hammering on things ever since. So... <laughs> Burley, what does the sound of drums and percussion do to your ears when you hear that these days? Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm attracted to the sound, but as much as the sound, I'm attracted to the feel mm. um, of it. Uh, uh, you know, like even, even, and it's just uh, rhythmic patterns or, 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 or lack of pattern, you know, like, like rain falling or, or I remember being in a, a Indian restaurant in New York City, and I was down in the the bathroom, and they had a window open that went out to the alley, and the wind was blowing through the alley, and uh, there was this something was it, the wind was making something flap, but it was flapping, and it was the best drum solo I ever heard in my life. It was just amazing because it would play a pattern, but then it would shift to another pattern, and it was like 
it, I mean, I've, I've been trying to emulate that drum solo or that, that solo, that flapping can, whatever it was, for about 20 years now. It's like it's – so inspiration is everywhere. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. Do you remember what your first drum set was like? Yeah. Um, well, I remember that uh, my my neighbors um, – I think I was living in Pomona at the time. I had come back from Turkey and were living in Pomona. And uh, my neighbors had a little toy drum set, you know. And uh, I, so I destroyed it, you know. Uh, and then I, I think I destroyed another neighbor's <laughs> toy drum. So finally, I think the neighborhood moms came over to my mom and said, I think you should, you know, get this, get your kid something. So he quit beating up our you know, destroying all our toys for our kids. So I got a, I got a decent drum set by, you know, 19, oh gosh. So it would have been like 1960 or so standards. You know, it was like, uh, I think out of, um, might've been out of Sears and Roebuck or something like that. But yeah, but I mean, and I think, and so I set it up as best I could. And my parents came in and watched me play it. And I think, I just, the look on their faces was sheer horror. Like, <laughs> Oh, well, what did we do? You know, <laughs> but I had, I had, I had a, a little music behind me before uh, getting that drum set. I grew up playing bugle and, and, uh, at, and for a while there, when we were on military bases, I would play the, the bugle calls mm. uh, on the, you know, I play Reveille, I play taps and stuff like that, you know, over a microphone going over the bass. And so I had, a, I had a little star thing happening already. Yeah, you did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then years later, you attended UCLA and you studied music with the famed jazz drummer, Freddie Gruber. And yeah. for listeners, he played with Charlie Parker and Harry Gibson. What was it like studying with somebody like Freddie? Well, uh, yeah. So it, that was an eye opener because, uh, um, uh, up until that time, I, I had really I had minor experiences with uh, with, you know, the real uh, people that were versed in that lifestyle. OK. Uh, and, and all the things that came with it, you know, uh, good and bad. Uh, so meeting Freddie um, uh, was was an eye opener about. Uh, well, f the biggest thing I learned from Freddie um uh, uh, he, you know, he taught technique and, but what he did by teaching you a certain way of technique, he opened your ability to, to play certain fields, to make something feel a certain way, which is really the ultimate goal of technique, uh, is to be able to get inside a, a, a feeling or, a, 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 you know, to bring the best out of a musical composition, which is usually the feeling that leads to the emotion that, you right. know, people get from the music, so... But uh, his stories were so uh, incredibly graphic that uh, uh, it was, you know, my my virgin ears were, you know, like <laughs> were were on fire. You know, but <laughs> but it, it was I wouldn't have traded it for anything in the world. And, you know, and he, um, you know, he was a, a good taskmaster in a way when he saw me like uh, drifting off into, uh, you know, trying things that weren't good for me, you know, he would say, Hey man, basically saying, don't, don't, uh, don't do what I did. L let me just tell you. Okay. <laughs> you know, save yourself. Right. Let me lead the way. Yeah. And so that was good. But, uh, some of those lessons were very, uh, I remember going to lessons there. And there was a period where I would go where, I mean, one of my, my great icons is Jim Keltner, uh, the, the famous, you know, world famous drummer and he would he would uh be there when i would be taking my lessons and uh and that was nervous enough but he'd bring along mitch mitchell from the Jimi hendrix experience because they were buddies and for some reason they thought it was okay you know that it was cool just to go watch this little kid take his lessons you know but the little kid was sweating bullets because you know you know you know two of your favorite people in the world are watching you make it, make a fool out of yourself, you know? Right. And, uh, so anyway, but it was, it was great. And, uh, yeah, like it was a great experience. Yeah. You signed up for a musician's contract service for $5 and within yeah. a week 
all three members of Ambrosia was formed without ever playing together, which was Joe Puerta, David Pack, Chris North, and yourself. How did you guys know or think that this would work? Well, okay, so the, yeah, they found my little three by five card on a, in a little storefront. You paid five bucks, you put your card up, and uh, and I think they called me because of my name. You know, the name was unusual enough, and then uh, you know, and I think I actually got in the band because I had a van. You know, that was the deal. <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you had a van, you were valued. You could take all the equipment. <laughs> you could drive. Yeah. <laughs> But so they came over to my house and uh, we, I was still in, we were all in college, different colleges and, uh, and they came over and I think our mutual excitement for uh, different kinds of music and, and, and it was like, it was, it was like really like meeting three of three kindred spirits. Mm. I mean, and they all had their, everybody in Ambrosia had their so-called forte, you know, or their main interest, uh, but they were so into everybody else's thing and respected everything. And I think it was, it was just such a, a, an unending amount of input coming from, you know, four different sources that the first time we sat up and actually played, we, I think the first song lasted at least an hour and a half, you know, <laughs> it just, it just, we couldn't stop. And, you know, it, that was the beauty of Ambrosia. Yeah. How did the name Ambrosia get chosen for the group? <laughs> Well, okay. So before I was in the band, they were called Ambergris Mite. Ambergris Mite, I think, is the little stuff they take out of the whale it's, that they make perfume out of. Um, but lo and behold, another band came out with a, an album called, and their name was Ambergris. Mm. So Joe, the bass player, uh, he uh, he looked in the dictionary. Uh, at Ambergris, and the next word was Ambrosia. He says, "Oh, that'll do." <laughs> <laughs> and it, it's it's a pretty cool name, you know. It 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 really ori- originally mean the nectar. It was the nectar or the food that kept the Greek gods immortal. So we we're thinking, oh yeah, our music's going to be immortal, you know. That's right. Uh, but of course now, uh, if you go to England, it's the leading it's the leading brand of rice pudding. Uh, so that if you if you're in what happened, you know, we were recorded in England and you know we're we're chatting up the babes in the pub and uh you go, Oh, what's the name of your band? And they go, Ambrosia, oh rice pudding. <laughs> <laughs> That's gotta make you guys oh, we're fitting right oh, yeah. in. <laughs> so proud, yeah, at that moment. Yeah. What music groups or artists influenced you guys early on? What were you guys looking at? Well, I mean that is such a wide uh, scope, but uh, as groups, as musical groups, traffic was huge. Mm. Uh, King Crimson was huge, but the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, um, you know, the the harmony bands were, were big time for us, but then also Tony Williams lifetime and, uh, and, you know, Miles Davis. And uh, there was, um, we, our first band house was in Hermosa beach and, um, and you, I could walk from that house down to the place called the Lighthouse, which was a famous jazz club. And they they got to, you know, they started recognizing me. Who's this kid standing outside our club every night? So they had one of those uh, Dutch doors, I think you call it, where they can open the top half. and. Oh, yeah, the bottom seat's closed. So the second set, they would always open the top half of the door so I could lean in, you know, <laughs> and see the bands. And then finally, they started letting me come in for the second set. And, you know, because I, I didn't have a penny at that time. So it was like, I saw everybody. I saw everybody. Wow. So Lee Morgan, you know, uh, Return to Forever, Chick Corea, you know, Jazz Messenger, you name it. I saw, I would sit, my... My favorite drummers like Art Blakey and Philly Joe Jones, I'd be sitting like like a foot from their hi-hat, like just, you know, like, I mean, I'm sh- and I would get these looks from them, white kid, don't touch my drum set. You know? <laughs> yeah, it was, but it was great. It was great. What do you remember and where was the first concert for Ambrosia? Oh, well, our uh, we did a, a ton of... Um, local concerts okay. you know like uh you know when we were before we were assigned or had uh, um 
a deal. And we, the, and we play at these free clinics and they'd have these concerts. And unfortunately, they'd put the acid in the punch and stuff like that. And uh, so, and, you know, and we were pretty far out. We were very far out. We did. We'd uh, we'd have these concerts where we would play our original music, but in the middle of the songs, we'd we'd have Luciano Berrio playing, you know, this computer making love to a woman, and we'd be hammering hammering nails and sawing, and we'd have a conductor conducting it all, you know. And you imagine the audience out there on acid, like, what, you know, <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, so, but then we our very first concert, I think, was. Uh, I think in San Diego or some a big auditorium and we were on with the bill with fog hat and people like this. And that was kind of during the anti uh, uh, Nixon thing or something at, at that period, I think. And we had the, so we got Dave, um, uh, our guitar player, singer, he, he got this big, huge rubber Nixon mask and he was going to make a political statement. Right. So we opened the show and he's wearing this huge rubber mask, but he didn't realize <laughs> He didn't realize he couldn't sing through it. So, you know, he's up there and the thing was like, he, he the thing was so hot, you know, and it was like, he would, you could just see water pouring down his, and he couldn't get it off. And he, you know, it's it just a disaster. So anyway, live and learn, you know. How was it with the group when you guys toured with Fleetwood Mac and you also toured with Doobie Brothers? Well, the Doobie Brothers were fantastic and they became close friends and, uh, in fact, in fact, I mean, uh, Ambrosia, the current Ambrosia, has played with Michael McDonald many times. Mm. We'll be, we're, we're kind of his benefit band. If he needs a band, you know, to go do a major benefit, we're there, you know. And uh, and and he's helped us out too, you know. Uh, I've had benefits for you know uh, different people, and I call him, and he's he's so kind and so generous. He's he he never says no. He's amazing. So the Doobies were very close. I mean, Fleetwood was another, uh, it, it was a little different. They were, they were just breaking. They had had over my head and, uh, I mean, they were great. They were all fine, but they were, they were in a kind of a little more private because I mean, every night you'd see them pairing up, you know, with, with a different person, you know, like, I mean, every week, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the great people. I mean, and I learned so much watching the Mick Fleetwood. I think that's when I realized, okay, you can play a lot of stuff, but can you play it and make it feel that good? You yeah. Know? And uh, so he, he really taught me a lot just by watching him. Yeah. The band auditioned for Herb Elpert and a and Records, but signed with 20th Century Fox. How did you get signed with 20th Century? Did it come from that audition or was it something totally separate? Yeah, it actually in a roundabout way did come that from that because um, uh, we did we did the audition uh, for Herb Alford and I remember we we were so nervous because it was our first exposure to the record world you know the recording mm. world and you know and so I remember uh, Herb Alford walking into this big sound stage and we were playing and. Um, you know, I, for some reason, all of a sudden I couldn't control my right foot. You know, I, I couldn't make it boom. I couldn't make it hit the bass drum. It was like, that's, you know, nerves can do strange things to you. In fact, he suggested, why don't I put a string on it and pull it? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> ah, anyway, but he, he thought he heard something. So he, he gave us a chance to record three demos, which we did at A&M. Uh, now he passed on it, but then, um, uh, eventually, uh, a studio we were working at, uh, an engineer, a friend of ours played the demos for this guy, a studio owner, and he was good friends with Russ Regan at 20th Century Fox. So he, he took it to 20th Century Fox, the very same songs. And the guy signed us, Russ Regan. Russ Regan's the guy that discovered Elton John, Neil Diamond, you know, uh, Olivia Newton, John, Barry White. So, you know, he had, he had some years. Mm -hmm. So, so <laughs> on our first album, getting ready for our first album, we did, we demoed up 50 songs. I mean, like, I mean, recorded them to the point where they were records and he came in and he heard it all and he, he listened to all 50. Wow. And yeah, I mean, it was pretty, I mean, that'd be hard for me to do, but he did it. 
And he picked three songs. He picked Nice, Nice, Very Nice, Holding On Yesterday, and uh, and I think um, um, uh, Mama Frog, which was very outside. And he goes, he goes, can you give me an album of this? You know, he goes, I, ha- I have the country, I have the pop, I have the R&B, you know, which we had done, all those things. He goes, but I don't have this progressive thing, you know, this melodic progressive music. He goes, I'd like to have that. And, and we were delighted because that's, that's what we love the most. Uh, so, you know, we got to work and finished our first album along, you know, following our, our true, what I think Ambrosia style was. And, uh, and we did okay. Early, you've recorded on every Ambrosia record since 1970. You've been with the band throughout its history. You've played over 3,500 shows with them and only missed two from my understanding. How do you explain this longevity? I have to say that Ambrosia, I mean, like we're, li- we're leaving today for a show tomorrow. Uh, and I, this morning before we got together, I had to, I had to go practice those tunes because it's, it's not like Ambrosia is uh, complicated or demanding enough that you can't just think you're going to walk on stage and, and kill it. You're not. I mean, it's been my experience. I've, you know, I've tried to take it for granted, but I can't. So uh, it it's music that uh, demands you to be kind of on your game. And so um, I think that's, that's, so in that sense, musically, I respect it enough that it's always a challenge and it's, uh, I, I, I'm still working on it, you know, 50 years later, still working on it to make it what I think, you know, as good as it can be, you know, finding new ways to play it, things like that, you know? Right. Looking back, what do you feel was the breakout moment for Ambrosia? Well, um, we were we were uh, in uh, on our first album, I think, with nineteen seventy five. Uh, Holding on to yesterday was out, and I remember going to a radio station in Denver, and um, and they they had their 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 listing of songs, you know, one two three, four, you know, mm-hmm. the, and I remember looking on the listing. And holding on was number one. Number two was one of these nights. And I go, okay, <laughs> I guess we're doing okay. Uh, and that was one moment. And then um, years, years later, uh, not, I mean, several years later, I remember hearing Biggest Part of Me on the radio for the first time and realizing, I think we hit the, I think we hit the button here, you know, and uh, oh, and then I got a, I played with a bass player that was uh, Billy Cobham's bass player. I did a gig with him and he told me the story that he was driving through Europe uh, with, and Billy Cobham was driving the, the band and biggest part of me came on and Billy cranked it up and just turned to him and goes, man, this is the shit. You know? <laughs> and Billy Cobb says, it's okay. It's okay. It's you know? okay. <laughs> As I said in the intro, Ambrosia had five Grammy nominations, five hit singles, sold out concerts worldwide, singles such as listeners, you may have heard of How Much I Feel, which was the top three. We've talked about Biggest Part of Me, You're the Only Woman, Holding On to Yesterday. A couple singles I'd like to ask you about, Burley, is the first one is if you would talk about feeling alive again. Yeah. Wow. Um, That probably, that. Well, that's kind of a strange uh, story because um, we were, uh, you know, kind of on, we were on Warner Brothers and we were kind of riding high. Uh, you know, we had those two hits, Biggs Part of Me, You're the Only Woman off that album. We could have had a third with Living on My Own, but we decided to release a rock and roll thing that did not go, you know, didn't do it. Uh, but we, we had dinner with a guy named Bob Regeer from Warner Brothers, who was kind of the uh, avant-garde guy at Warner's and he was saying, Hey, he goes, what's going on? You know? And it's like the first time we really got together with this guy, he's going, I championed you guys for Warner brothers because uh, I I wanted the progressive stuff. And we're going, what, you know, (laughs) which we never stopped doing progressive music, but you know, we always, we only had two or three songs like that up per album. He goes, yeah, can you, let's go, let's do an album of the progressive stuff. And uh, we're going, really, really? You know, and so 
so we we did our last album uh rhode island and we kind of went back to the prog stuff in the course of doing that album this guy passes away wow and we we hand in the album to warner brothers and they go what's this <laughs> you go where's biggest part of me where's where's you know and we you know i mean feeling alive was probably the closest thing to it uh i thought we had another song on there called uh how can you love me i thought that could have been a single but they they just heard the album and kind of thought man uh you know they were so set uh in how much I, biggest part of me and you're the only woman they thought they it was going to be an album of that and it wasn't so uh that album didn't really do very well and uh, that was kind of the end of our warner's run you know so the other one is 1976, you recorded the Beatles song Magic Mystery Tour for a documentary, All This and World War II, and it's become now a staple of your live shows. What has made the embracement of this Beatles song work so well? Well, I think it's just the Beatles. I mean, uh, uh, how can you? I mean, that's funny. There's a sh- my wife and I are watching. My wife is Mary Harris, by the way, who's in the band. Yeah, right. Watching the McCartney, the McCartney special that's out right now, three, two, one, McCartney. Oh my gosh, it's just amazing. And uh, but the Beatles, uh, we were very fortunate to um, be able to do that track, and it was very different for us because I think Bud Horner, the producer, came in to work with us, which we had never worked with an outside producer. We had always done it ourselves, and he came in, and you know, Ambrosia can tend to take its time. But he whipped it out in like two days. We were done. And, uh, you know, it's like, it was so funny because we do a drop, we do a track, a basic track. And, uh, and, and you know, and as soon as we're done, uh, we're, you know, we're thinking, okay, that's just a warm up. That's it. And we go, got it. Thank you. And we're going, what, 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 what? No, no, no. <laughs> he goes, okay, next vocal. Who's singing? <laughs> it's like, wow. Uh, so anyway, so that, yeah, we still love that love playing that song and you know it's uh it's taken a life of its own have you ever met any of the beatles uh yes um i met ringo i hung out with ringo at one of his new year's eve parties and um and uh i almost met paul and my wife never forgives me for this because we were in a long line to meet paul and i you know i wanted to know i thought it would be hours and and then we left and we found out that Joe and Joe, my buddy and Ambrosia got to go in two minutes later. And my wife still gets mad at me about that. <laughs> also with Ambrosia, because all the original members haven't been together from the get go to where you're at today. Bruce Hornsby's played with Ambrosia, Michael yeah. McDonald and Alan Parsons. An actual all four Ambrosia members played on the first Alan Parsons project LP as well. How was it, I mean, working with some of these other great artists that have joined your group? Well, Alan, I, I mean, I wouldn't say they were, they were in our group, but um, uh, they, we, you know, they were, there was, they were such friends that Alan was mixing our first album at the time. Okay. And, 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 uh, and during the course of mixing, uh, he and Eric, uh, his partner, Eric, I forget his last name, sorry. Uh, asked us to play on Alan's first album, Tales of Mystery and Imagination, but they didn't tell us the title and they wouldn't tell us the title of the song uh, because they didn't want anybody to steal the concept or anything like that. So, you know, um, yeah, it was, it, they called it the raver, but it was the Raven and uh, they brought it out to us. And Joe, Joe tells a funny story about this because, you know, when they first brought it out to us, you know, we're expecting this grand piece of music and they go, okay, so it goes like this. Boom, boom, <laughs> boom, boom, boom. And, th- th- and they're just doing this like for minutes and we're going, we're looking at each other like, wow, this is great. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be a hit. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we eventually start playing it and thank God Joe started going, and then I changed everything, you know, then it, then it became a tune, but thank God. <laughs> In 89, you guys reunited all four original members after being years apart. What made this 
all happen? Uh, well, uh, not to incriminate, uh, but, uh, you know, I think around 82, 83, after we did Rhode Island, uh, we realized that the business of Ambrosia was pretty funky. I mean, you know, we had signed bad deals. Uh, we had, we weren't, you know, we weren't getting, we were doing other people's albums to make a living, you know? So, and here we had had these hits and, um, you know, so it just, it just got to the point where, um, the climate wasn't very good in it within Ambrosia. And I think we needed, you know, we needed to, to go out, do our own thing for a while. Mm -hmm. And I, I have to admit that it was the best thing that ever happened to me because I met my wife. I had, I had a family, you know, it was all of a sudden it was like, um, uh, uh, that was the best thing to happen in my life. I mean, my career is, is great. And, but it was, I, I wasn't the happy, it was, you know, it was kind of lonely, you know, you're, you're in a studio, you're on, you're on a bus, you're on a, you're on a stage, you're in the studio, you're on a bus, you're on a stage, you know, but I met my wife and I feel like my life began, you know, so, so I think we all kind of experienced that in a sense. And then we kind of realized that at some point, um, yeah, we went out and learned a lot playing with other people now and doing other projects. Let's, uh, let's get back together and see what we can do. And, you know, a lot had changed and it was kind of like, we weren't like, you know, doing world tours right off the bat. We had to kind of work our way back in as a band and get it back together and create something. And it's been a, you know, a long process. And then, uh, you know, Dave about out, I think around nine, no, uh, 2000 uh because he was getting more you know we he was to be he couldn't be there all the time so we needed we needed to make a firm band so and you know and now uh i think the pa the band is probably as good or better than it ever has been yeah so yeah you talked about your wife meeting your wife and what that's meant to you but you're performing on stage with her she's a member of ambrosia your wife played with Jimmy Buffett and had stints with Pink Floyd and some other big names. How did she end up joining Ambrosia? Well, during the, during the process where we were coming back and putting, putting it back together, uh, you know, uh, music, some of the members of the, uh, of the touring band would be in and out, you know, like, because we weren't booking a hundred dates a year you know, guys had other gigs and, you know, they were juggling stuff to be able, like we all were to make, be able to do it. And my wife, it really is one of the best musicians I know. So if a keyboard player couldn't make it, Mary would just, you know, uh, hunker down for two or three days and then go do be the keyboard player. You know, if we needed a tenor singer, she sang the tenor parts, you know, she, she would just, you know, she could do that. And, um, you know, so eventually it, you know, we wised up and just go, well, let's just put her in the band, you know, because, <laughs> you know, we, we kind of had, I mean, we kind of had this mistaken image. Okay. Ambrose is this all male band, you know? And then we realized my, it's so funny. My dad back in the seventies was going, you need a girl in your band. <laughs> <laughs> and he was right. You know, <laughs> in the nineties, you formed Tindrum. With your wife, you've released three CDs. Yeah. First single was Surrender, which was produced by Alan Parsons and received some pretty good airplay. Some of your children, Mickey and Sierra Rose, have played with the band, along with your grandchildren. How does this whole family affair work with Tindrum? Oh, it's great. Um, yeah. Uh, so uh, Tindrum started because uh, my wife, and my before Ambrosia uh, was back together again, or I mean, doing much um, you know, she was touring and I was touring. I was playing a lot with Jim Messina and the Lost Dogs and bands like that recording. And so we would, we had a son, our son. And when he was very young, we literally would hand him off to each other in airports, you know, like I'd be going out, she'd be coming in. Hi, honey, here's, our, here's Mickey. Uh, okay. I'll see you in a couple of days. And it, it got to the point where we, we just talked, says we have to, we have to maybe start playing together, you know, maybe put a project together. We can work together so we can be together more. 
And so that was the impetus for St- a tin drum. And yeah, we did three albums and, you know, we had some, we had great success, you know, um, on, on a smaller level, we weren't international or anything, but, um, but so then we get to our, our, our kids were coming up and writing their own songs and they be do little bits on our albums. But then during this COVID we're all here. And so we just started playing together and doing this family band and I'm my kids are the stars. I mean, my son and my daughter, they steal the show. They are, they're writing such great songs and they, you know, they, they, they brought new life uh, to Mary and I, you know, about music. And it's, uh, it, 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 it's the, it's a blessing. And it's, you know, the hidden blessing in this whole COVID thing is that, and now we're gigging. We're out there gigging as the Tin Drum family band. Nice. Love it. Love yeah. it. Burley, where does your creative thirst come from? Oh, wow. That's a, that's a good question. I, I, I don't know. I, I, I kind of just wake up with a, with a big desire to, I spread, I mean, especially play drums. I mean, I, I, I love to write, but I have to make myself write. Uh, and I love to do, I love to produce, but that's, that's a job. I, if I walk in a room and there's a bunch of instruments, I'll get to them unless there's a drum set. If there's a drum set there, it's all over. You know, it's just, I, I can't help it. I just. <laughs> <laughs> it's an addiction that draws you it, right it, to it. It is. It really is. It's like, I can't stop thinking about it. You know? Yeah. In 97, Ambrosia released the anthology CD. And that seemed to ignite something from the fans and spark a new interest. Why do you feel like that happened? Well, probably just because there, I think, uh, uh, because of publicity, things like mm-hmm. that, all of a sudden, you know, there's something new. The band, it was kind of an announcement. The band is back, you know, maybe. So, um, you know, it, getting in everybody's consciousness is the hardest part. You know, it's like, um, I mean, I had a, a, a great um, manager named Steve Moyer, who um, uh, he, he was, we were talking, he was a fan of Tin Drum, and, you know, he was trying to encourage me, and he was saying, he, he goes, really, you know, of one out of a hundred people that hear your record would buy it, he goes, you have an audience. He goes, you just have to find, you just have to find that one in a hundred, which means you have really, it's all about promotion. You know, it's all about, I mean, nowadays, DIY artists, they have to really spend half their time doing the promotion if they expect it to do anything. And it's just because that's that's the mountain you have to climb. Mm-hmm. What do you feel the future of music is then with radio play not being as prevalent as it, it used to be? Yeah, that's interesting uh, because uh, Am- Ambrosia is toying with a, releasing a bunch of songs that we did that were never released or I never saw the light of the day because of one reason or another. And there's this one song um, that we have that I think is as good as anything Ambrosia's ever done. In fact, it's my favorite tune that Ambrosia's ever done. And I'm, I'm desperate for it to get out, you know, um, it's politics involved, of course, but um you know, but I don't know if there would be a, a market, but I think it's such a good song that it would probably get in a movie. It would probably, you know, land somewhere. But yeah, in spite of the this, the condition of radio and so forth like that, I think good music still will find a way out. It it may not be the traditional way because I don't think the traditional way exists, but I think it'll get out there somehow. I got I got to believe that. Got to believe it. Yeah. How has touring been since reopening and how are the crowds reacting to having live music back? Well, the crowd, the crowds are very enthusiastic. So we've only done four shows and tomorrow, tomorrow will be our fifth show uh, back. Uh, uh, I think it, it's only going to grow. I think people are uh, still a tad bit tentative about going out and, and especially right this minute because of the resurgence of certain things. But mm-hmm. I, I think it. I think it's going to be okay in the long run. I think it's going to take some time, unfortunately. 
Where can fans connect with either you, Ambrosia, on what social media platforms? Uh, well, um, and for a tin drum, uh, well, I'm on Facebook and Instagram, and tin drum music is on all those. Um, and uh, uh, ambrosialive.net is the Ambrosia site, ambrosialive.net, and you can email there. I could give you my address and people, you know, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put a link in the show notes to the Ambrosia site, Tin Drum site, and a couple of your Facebook things and listeners go to the show notes. You can just click on and get right connected with Burley and Ambrosia and Tin Drum. Sounds great. Thanks. Burley, thanks so much for taking some time uh, out of your day and being on the show, man. It's been fun. Thank you, man. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Oh, it's been an honor. People, I understand you've been looking for merch. I have it. BeforeTheLightsPod.com slash merch. Go there to check it all out and follow us on Instagram at Before the Lights Podcast. Until next time, this is Tommy Canale. Thank you for listening to Before the Lights. A salute. A chin chin. Chin chin.